Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Well, we are in our third week of our series, The Jesus Factor. The Jesus Factor, we are asking the question, how does Jesus factor into our lives? How does Jesus factor into your life? That's the question that we're looking at, and that's the question that each and every one of us has to define for ourselves. I can't come up to any one of you and say, this is who Jesus is, and this is what he should mean to you. I mean, I can say what he should mean to you, but you have to define in your own heart who Jesus is, who he is and what he means to you. Uh, we talked about the definition of, of a factor. A factor is one who acts or transacts business on behalf of another. So how does Jesus act or transact business in your life for you? So how does Jesus factor into your life? So far, we've looked at how John the Baptist has prepared the way for Jesus. I was the first message of the series, and we talked about the, the need for preparation and how we need to be prepared, and how John the Baptist came and prepared the way so that when Jesus came, that people understood who he was and who was coming, and they prepared the way for him. And last week, we looked at how Jesus not only has the power to heal physically, but how he is able to forgive our sins and the power that is in forgiveness. And one thing that we need to realize is that when this paralytic was brought before Jesus, that people in that culture and at that time, they looked at somebody who was paralyzed as being smited by God, that they were such great sinners that God wasn't even going to allow them to be mobile, that God inflicted them so heavily for their sin that they could barely function in society. Anyone who had any kind of infirmity was considered a great sinner in that kind of society. So when Jesus forgave his sins, that sent a message throughout. And then he healed on top of forgiving the sins, showing that he has authority to forgive sins. So today... Um, we are, we are looking at key events throughout this series that surround the ministry of Jesus. So today, we are going to be looking at Peter's proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah. See, when Jesus asked, who am I? Jesus, Peter says, well, you're, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. So when we think about Jesus and his disciples, we may believe that uh, Jesus and his disciples is a unique situation. That the concept of having disciples is just unique to Jesus. That Jesus is the only one who has disciples. Now, the way we understand the word disciple today, it is mostly when in reference to Jesus. But the concept and the, the practice of having disciples was pretty common back then. There was a lot of people who gathered followers and taught. They were teachers. And who you learned under, who, you, you, who brought you up in the teachings of anything, pretty much told people who you were. That was, it was prestigious to whoever you were being taught by. If there was a really a prestigious teacher and you studied under this teacher, then you were thought to be as wise or have the knowledge and the wisdom of this teacher. You are basically a part of his teaching. So this is not something new. It's not unique to just Jesus. But think about it that today, this concept is seen today, and it's really seen a lot in our social media. Not just, not just the social media, but it's, it's all over. But think about like the terminology and the things that we associate with things like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and LinkedIn. Uh, and it just names a few of the, the sites that are out there. But it's a concept of having others follow us. It's as common today as it was back then. Uh, I, some of them have, you know, likes and then follow me and views. And, and we can tell our popularity or who's following us or who's 
watching us by the number of whatever we have. However many likes, however many followers, however many um, views they have of our, our videos or whatever. So the, the, the concept of gathering followers and, and people studying under someone or just, just looking to somebody is, is as common today as it was back then. It may not be in the same form because I look at things like uh, people who are, are like famous. There's a lot of people who are famous that, that have followers. We follow, that's how they become famous. The more followers you have, the more famous you are. And it doesn't really matter what you do. There are people who are famous for really not doing a whole lot. They're just famous. They just, no, I remember back when uh, uh, the beer commercials would have uh, athletes come on. And Will Chamberlain, now who, Will Chamberlain was, uh, was, he was, he was seven foot, I think he was like seven foot one. And Will Chamberlain was doing a beer commercial. This was after he was, he was a basketball player. And he played for the Sixers, actually, at one time in his career. And he actually was doing commercials for, for this beer commercial. And they labeled him as Will Chamberlain, famous tall person. That was his title. They didn't tell him he was a famous basketball player or anything like that. Will Chamberlain, famous tall person. So he was famous, I mean, he was, I mean, his basketball playing uh, lended to his credentials as, as for being famous, but he was famous for being tall. And, and, uh, and there's other people out there, I mean, I think you can think of people who are just followed and watched of just goofy things. I mean, think about some of the videos that go viral. And you turn on your computer and you just go through these things and you gather people together and say, look at this, look at this, look at this, check this out. You send links to it and you send it all this stuff. Look at this, look at this. And people become like really, really famous, really well known over silly things. But there are also people who are gathering followers for, for teaching like philosophy and um, different you know, different areas of teaching, people gather followers. And, and you could, you know, a lot of their followers will, ad, you know, they'll readily say, well, I learn from so-and-so. Or they'll constantly be quoting so-and-so. This person says this. And uh, I believe this because, you know, this person mentions this. So the concept of, of following and being a follower of someone is not unique to Jesus. Okay. The fact that he was out there and that he was teaching almost lent to the fact that he was going to attract followers. It all depended on what he was talking about. So he has these 12 uh, apostles. Well, they're actually not apostles yet because the term apostle means sent. So he had not sent them yet. So they were at this point, they were still disciples. So a little trivia for you if you ever, if you ever need to know what the difference is between disciple and apostle. You can drop that at the next party you're at. Okay, so it's a little little trivia there. Well, the apostle is this, but you know. But today, uh, today we call people we call them fans if they have followers. Um, fans is short for fanatics. Okay, and um, you know, you know, uh, when it's related to Jesus, they call people Jesus freaks. You know, it's like you know, it's like that's a but fans, like, you know, baseball fans is like they were fanatic about the person that they're rooting for, the team that they're rooting for. They were just really fanatical about it. And we have that today. You know, singers, actors, athletes, anyone associated with entertainment basically has a fan base. And their fan bases are their followers. But again, there are some out there who um, I know, like, you'll see, like, Dr. Phil's pretty popular. He has followers. You know, he, people come on his show, they're in, uh, usually, a lot, you know, and that's the thing. We see people at their worst on these shows, and, you know, he tries to help them. So a lot of people, they really put a lot into what Dr. Phil says. You know, oh, I was watching this the other night, Dr. Phil says this. You know, so he has a lot of followers. And, his, and he's a teacher. He's a, you know, he's a psychologist, and he teaches people, and so people adhere to his teaching. Colleges or universities, if you attend a certain college or university, that that goes forward when you, like, you know, when you apply 
and, and people, you become known for something. It's like, oh, yeah, he studied there. She studied at this place. Okay. So the prestige of a university also lends to your credibility for where, where you study. So finding someone to study under and learn their concepts was is a common practice today, and it was as common a practice back then as well. So we always think of Jesus and his disciples as this unique set of people who are there, you know, back then, but it's still still happening today. Now, how influential are most people beyond their own time? That's the question I want to look at today. How influential are people beyond their own time? Because people today are very influential today. You, know, you, go on, you can go on the computer, read papers, go on television, watch the news, and these people, you know, people that are mentioned there are very influential today. But how influential will they be 20 years from now? I remember a couple of years ago, there was some award show out, and uh, Don Henley, uh, he's a drummer for a group called the Eagles. They were very famous back in the 70s, okay? And um, he was getting some kind of award, but as he, was, uh, as he was receiving this award, somebody had prior to this was making derogatory comments about him. Uh, not about him, but basically about the Eagles and, and, and the individual members of the band. And... Don Henley goes to receive this award, and he was, he was asked about these comments and stuff like that. And I don't even remember the guy's name who said anything, uh, who said this stuff. Uh, he had a little bit of notoriety at the time, and I think he was using this occasion to try to give himself a little more notoriety. But Don Henley says, because the Eagles at this time, were, they had a, a bunch of bands came together and made an album a con an album that was a tribute to the Eagles. They all did individual songs on the album. And Don Henley's comments was, well, in 20 years, I wonder how many, I wonder if they're ever going to have a tribute album for this guy. And with that alone, it was like everybody's, yeah, yeah, right. In 20 minutes, this guy's, nobody's going to be giving him a tribute because, you know, he's that unknown, you know. So it, it's, people are influential in a moment in the moment and in their time. And some people can latch on, but usually when they're gone from the scene, so is their influence. So is most of the stuff. Now, we have things today where you know we can record things and we can videotape things and, and stuff. And that stuff could hang around. But I mean, think about things like, you know, like Elvis when he first passed on. His records were coming out, and, and, you know, all kinds of stuff were coming out. But, you know, that's been like almost 30 years. It's like how influential is Elvis's music today? You know, we have presidential libraries, and you can go throughout the country and, and visit the presidential libraries of no, numerous uh, American presidents. I'm not sure if all of them have one, but I know a lot of them do. And... They were very influential in their time. And some of the things and the policies and the things that they started carried forward. But as time goes on, a lot of that stuff goes, you know, it forms and shapes some things that we may do today and not even realize it. The, you know, there's all, the, all the technology that we use today, it's based on somebody else's discoveries and we discover upon, discover upon, and discover upon. But do we remember the person who started it all? How influential are they and are their teachings and their, their things? So, you know, think of, think of someone that you can think of that still has influence in the world today from history. And if we think, you know, a lot of people, I know a lot of people don't like history. Um, I, I do. I like history. Uh, I know others do as well. But most people are like, ah, you know, it, that happened already. I don't want to memorize dates and places and, and things like that. So we kind of like dismiss things from history because of it. And it's like, well, that was important. And, you know, the old saying, if those who forget history are doomed to repeat it and, and all that. But 
when we think back, and we can name people from history, but how much influence do they have on the lives of us today? You know, go back 2,000 years or even 100 years and think about who from history is still influential, that we're still quoting, and we're still saying, oh, so-and-so said this, and, you know, I want to live my life by the concepts that this person said and this person did. So how many people do you think of throughout history who have that same kind of influence? And also, can you think of anyone who's alive today who could be mega famous and mega everything and have everything going for them in this life? How many of those people, any one person do you think that 2,000 years from now people will still be talking about the way they do today, that they would have as much influence on people's lives 2,000 years from now as they still do today, okay? Think about that concept because why does Jesus still have people talking about him and following him today? Uh, what happened at Caesarea Philippi, I believe, shed some light on that question. Why are people still following Jesus today? See, Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. Now, what's interesting about this is that Jesus was mainly ministering around the, on, in the towns around the Sea of Galilee, a Galilee. He was ministering on these towns. Caesarea Philippi is 30 miles north of Galilee. Okay? 30 miles was a big deal back then to travel, okay? You couldn't just get in their SUV and travel 30 miles. You know, it'd take us about a half an hour. Unless you're in a city, it'll take you about four. But um, that's, you know, it, but they, you know, they had to walk and 30 miles, you know, you think it took them some time to get there. So why is Jesus taking them to Caesarea Philippi of all places? And why at Caesarea does he ask this question? He could have asked it on the road. He could have asked it in Galilee. He could have asked it anywhere. But he asked it here. Now, what's interesting about Caesarea Philippi is that it is, a, it is the capital of Philip. Uh, Philip the, he was the, the son of the patriarch Herod the Great. Okay? So his son Philip, he took over this city, and that was his region of the world. And he made this his capital, uh, and he named it, it was... He named it Caesarea after Augustus Caesar, and so this is for you guys who don't like history, okay, so, uh, but for you who do, you may not, you may already know this, and you'll probably correct me afterwards, but he, he, uh, he, na he named it, uh, but then to, there was also a, a city on the coast that was called Caesarea, so to distinguish the two, he called it Caesarea Philippi, naming it after himself and Caesar Augustus, so he's in it, and this was a big city. It was a big town, and it was, had lots of pagan influences, okay? A lot of pagan influences in this town. But it was, since it was the capital, it also was a military establishment, too. A lot of the military stuff, you know, was there. So Jesus takes his disciples here, and he starts to tell them, he starts asking them this question, who am I? Who do people say I am? That's the first question. Who do people say I am? So they're all like, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So everybody around is linking Jesus with a prophet. They're saying, like, oh, you, you know, you're one of the prophets, okay? This is people from the, Israel's history. And he goes, okay, well, that, that's cool. Um, what about you guys? You know? You guys have been following me for a while. You've been seeing what's been going on. Watch me heal people. Watch me forgive sins. You're, you, you're, you're catching some things here. Who do you say that I am? And I'm sure they probably looked at each other for a while and they're like, I don't know, Jesus, you know, you're from Nazareth, you know. But at that point, Peter stands up and he goes, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus' response was, 
That information was not revealed to you by man. That information was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. That information does not come through the knowledge of man. To say that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, the, the Messiah, what Peter was saying was that he was the one. He wasn't just the guy. He wasn't just one of the prophets. Saying he is the guy. Because the Messiah was the one person who was appointed by God to come and do have a very specific purpose for God. And that purpose was to save his people. So what they're saying is, you are the guy. You are the one. Now, the people of that time had a concept of a Messiah, of being a conquering hero who will come and overthrow their oppressors. And at this time, it was the Romans. But the Israelites, they have had many oppressors over the years, people conquering them, overtaking them. And just, it's a constant turmoil over who's ruling over them. And at one time, they ruled themselves before they were conquered and taken into exile. And the Messiah was the one who was going to come and restore all things. When you hear the term restore all things, what that meant to the Israelites was that things were going to be back to the way they should have been when David was king, when Solomon was king. We didn't have people ruling over us. We ruled ourselves, and we had territory, and we, we didn't have people ruling over us. That was, their, that was their thoughts of a Messiah. Their, their Messiah was coming, and he was going to conquer the oppressors. But Jesus had a much bigger plan. He had a much bigger concept that he was going to teach these guys of who the Messiah truly is. So think about these guys. They're all sitting in this big city with all this. They've traveled a long way. They're sitting in this big city. And all of a sudden, they're looking at this stuff, and Jesus is starting to talk to them about the things that he's going to do. Peter, he says to Peter, upon this proclamation, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, what's interesting about what he says here is that the word that is used in the Greek is ekklesia. The word ekklesia is referring to a gathering of people. It is a gathering of people who are united by a common identity and a common purpose. And Jesus was saying that it is he was going to build this community. He was going to have his own assembly of people which he would be the foundation for. So the word church, because what happened over the years is that the word ecclesia was, was now being translated as church, and that came from the German word kirch, which basically means the house of the Lord. But Kirch was used to denote any ritual gathering place, whether it was Christian or whether it was pagan. That word church, that we translate church, is a location. And that's why we have a lot of confusion today because we'll say, you know, we'll say, well, we're, let's not just go to church, let's be the church. And understanding the differences between the two. Okay, Jesus wasn't talking about a location. Jesus was not talking about just people coming together on a Sunday for about an hour. Jesus was talking about a gathering of people that they had their identity and their purpose was founded in him. That it didn't matter if they were here in America or if they were in Europe or if they were in Asia. It didn't matter. Anywhere throughout the world that all of the people who followed Jesus, the people who were his ecclesia, were all founded. That was the gathering. It wasn't to put up buildings everywhere. That wasn't the purpose of what he was saying. He's saying that my gathering 
my gathering is going to be founded on the fact that he is the Messiah, the Holy One of the living God. That's what Jesus was saying. But Jesus' gathering was much bigger and much more than how we think of church today. So Jesus asked his disciple, who am I to you? Who do you say that I am? And Jesus asked the same question of his followers today. Who do people say that Jesus is? What do people, what do the people around you say about Jesus? But really more importantly is who do you say that Jesus is? Now the one thing we want to ask ourselves in light of the fact, because one thing, we live in America, and a lot of people know who Jesus is, their opinions and their thoughts about who he is and may differ, but most people know who Jesus is. And Jesus is still talked about around the world today. And we were talking earlier about the influence of people inside their own time. But Jesus' influence is beyond his own time. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked the earth. And we're still talking about him today. People still gather in his name today. People know who Jesus is today. Do you think that the fact of what Peter proclaimed of Jesus being the, being the Messiah, that he wasn't just an overzealous disciple, but you think the fact that we're still talking about Jesus today, that we still know who Jesus is today, that his writings, his, not his writings, his, his sayings, what he said, his teachings, that we still know about them, that the Bible is the biggest selling book around here, not that everybody's literate and in, in the, that the numbers don't support that, but the fact that we still have Bibles, we still have this ancient literature, could it be that Jesus truly is the Messiah? Who do you say that he is? Who do you know in history that still has influence today? Who do you know today who will still have influence a year from now? let alone 2,000 years from now. But I would be willing to bet you that 2,000 years from now, if Jesus doesn't come by then, that people will still be talking about him. He'll still have his gathering out there. He'll still have his assembly of people out there. People will still be talking and know the name of Jesus. The word of God will still be going forward. So we have to ask ourselves, when we take a look at history, and we take a look at all the things that go on in this world. If a man from Galilee, a small town of Nazareth, who was a carpenter, gathered 12 guys and went around teaching, and we're still talking about him today, do you think that there may be some truth to the fact of the matter that he is the one? He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one of God to come and set his people free. But it's not from the oppression from a foreign government, but it's from the oppression of sin. It's from the oppression of death. It is the oppression of anything that this world holds that Jesus has freed us from. That he tells us that we're no longer subject to any of these things. If Jesus truly is the Messiah, then he has come and he has set us free. He has set us free from sin and death. He has the power to forgive sin and to heal the afflictions that are associated with sin. The fact that we still talk about Jesus today the fact that anybody outside of his time still knows about him should say something to the claims that were being made. 
There were many people who claimed to be messiahs back then. There are people today who claim to be messiahs and saviors. But how many of them do we know from the past? And how many of those today will we know in the future? So, why do you think of all the people throughout history we still talk about Jesus today? When you go out in the world next week and you hear any conversations or anything related to faith, this is something you might want to remember. If Jesus is not who he claims to be, why are we still talking about him today? Why does he have so much influence? Why does anybody care? Because the one thing that people say is don't ever talk about religion or politics, okay? And because these are hot button issues. So if we say Jesus and we talk about Jesus, you know, there's always this thing, you know, you hear about it all the time, how they're trying to push God and Jesus out of here. We're not allowed to say Jesus here. We're not allowed to do this and, and that. Um, if Jesus didn't matter, would people even care if we brought up his name? I mean, if he didn't matter, what would it matter? Okay, you can believe what you want to believe, and I can believe what I want to believe. But when it comes to Jesus... Why are we still talking about him today, and why does he matter? The questions that Jesus asked people then, he still asks us today. He asks us right here, right now. Jesus is asking each and every one of us, who am I? Who am I, he's asking you. Who do you say that I am? Jesus is asking each and every one of us individually, not as a group, He's asking each and every one of us individually, who am I? Who am I to you? So who is Jesus to you? Is he just a good teacher? Just a good moral compass to follow? Because let me tell you something. There's a lot of people who could be a good moral compass to follow. There are a lot of people today who could be a good moral compass to follow. There are a lot of good teachers there have been a lot of good teachers throughout history. There are a lot of good teachers who nobody outside of their classroom will ever know who they are. But Jesus, we're still talking about him today. Who do you say that he is? Is he the Messiah to you? Is he the Messiah? Are you part of his ecclesia, his gathering, his assembly? Just sitting in a church does not make you part of that gathering. But knowing who he is and receiving him as the Messiah, that's what makes us all a part of his ecclesia. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you and we give you praise for preserving these scriptures for all these years. Lord, we thank you for the stories that are in there, the history that is in there, that we know that you lived. We know that you had followers. And we know that they proclaimed that you were the Messiah and that you gathered people unto yourself and you asked people to come. You didn't go into places proclaiming, I am the one. You allowed each and every person to come and receive that information by just being around you, by seeing what you did and knowing that for themselves. So we have to ask ourselves today why we still know about you. Could it be that you truly are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God? 
And Lord, I pray that each and every one that you ask, and you ask each and every one of us, that we know deep in our hearts that you truly are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, we pray this all in your name.